Okay. Hey, this is Stefan Kinsella. Uh, as most of you know, normally my podcast is um, just repeat of my appearances on other podcasts. Rarely do I do original shows. Um, and I guess this one is no different. Um, so a libertarian friend, JM, do you want to go by your full name or just JM or what? Uh, Jesse. Jesse uh, had been texting me asking some questions and wanted to do an interview. So do you have your own channel or are you just uh, Jesse? Um, I started my own channel um, under the assumption that I'm going to continue doing things like this in the libertarian or philosophical sphere. So you would be episode one if this okay. thing comes off the ground. So I think you did an episode one with Ma with Michael Malice. Is that right? Yeah, he had he had his show. Um, You're welcome on a previous network and he was switching to the gas digital network and I was going to New York that weekend and so he he asked me to come on for his uh, his first episode. I'm going to be pausing on occasion. I just got COVID, so I'm coughing a lot. So it's my Whoa. first post COVID interview. Don't worry, you okay. can't catch it over the uh, over the airwaves. We sure about that. There's viruses in computers. I've heard. That's um, true. There are. That's, there are. That's true. Um, so, um, where's your channel going to be, by the way? Is it YouTube or what? It'll be on YouTube. Okay, YouTube channel. Do you want to give it out? Yeah, it's called uh, This Time I'm Curious. Okay. Okay. You just wanted to talk about a, a hodgepodge of issues and, um, and uh, I'm, yeah. I'm okay with anything. So you take it from here. Cool. So um, yeah, I've been watching your stuff, binge watching your stuff for um, years and reading articles and things. And I remember thinking this guy's been asked every philosophical question under the sun, but if he ever came down to Austin, which is where I'm at, like I'd love to have dinner and drinks and maybe pick his brain about some not only philosophical things, but maybe your aesthetic preferences um, and little quirks and opinions about things. Um, but I would never forgive myself if I didn't ask you some philosophical questions in this. So maybe we we get the heavier stuff up front. By the um, way, you know, you know, I'm in Houston. I, I, I go to Austin on occasion. Do um, you ever do the Bitcoin stuff there or any of the libertarian stuff? Uh, I go to an anarchist meetup and play D and D with a bunch of um, libertarians and anarchists. But um, I'll have to check out your appearances on those things and uh, and hit you up. Yeah, there's there's a Bitcoin meetup I've been meaning to go to on occasion. But uh, yeah, next time I'm there, I'll let you know. There's a bunch of libertarians that came and met Anthony Samaroff when I was there last time, and um, it's a pretty healthy community. But uh, but go ahead. But and you know the readers, the listeners are going to say, so you you go to anarchist? Would you say you go to anarchist meetups and play D and D? They're going to say, but of course you do. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a total dork at all. Um, <laughs> uh, by the way, do you play? Have you played D and D? Um, since you're you're considered an uber dork. Uh, I played when I was like once or twice when I was 14 or something, but I didn't like it. I didn't like the unstructured nature of it. Maybe I didn't have a good dungeon master. Um, for me, it was like a bucket list thing. This was my first campaign. It was started about a year ago. And I remember thinking that's things that kids did in the 80s um, in movies. I didn't think that human beings actually did it. And I got invited to this thing. I was like, I don't know the rules. It sounds super complicated. Um, we roll dice and we tell stories and stuff. And I, I, I'm enjoying it. But um, but to get to the questions. So, you know, I've been in, in NCAP since around 2003. And I didn't meet one in person for 10 years. And when I met one, it felt like a long lost brother. Like we, we didn't stop talking the entire night. And um, again, it felt like a family member. You have been in the movement since like the eighties um, when it was unbelievably obscure. Yeah. Um, and, and now it seems like it's finally reached public consciousness. Like Michael Malice was interviewed on Jordan Peterson podcast where they talked mm -hmm. a, a little bit about it. Uh, Joe Rogan, Lex Friedman, Chris Williamson, <laughs> It seems like they're all, they're not immediately dismissing the, the question. And to me, that's way different than it used to be. Do, do you think that we're hitting some sort of inflection point or are you maybe more pessimistic? Uh, inflection point for what? For like mass adoption? Yes. No, I don't think it's coming anytime soon. Um, I do think that the numbers of libertarians has gone up by maybe an order of magnitude. Um, so something has changed. Um, <clears throat> I have my suspicions, but I, I, I've, uh, so I think what happened was the, or the original, you know, before my time in the, in the fifties and sixties, it was very small, like maybe a dozen or something. Right. Um, and then, uh, or a little bit more maybe with, 
with people that are quiet but just reading um and then in the 80s 70s 80s maybe 90s it was getting bigger and more established right um but still it was really small compared to the way it is now i think the libertarians back then my impression is i the way i came into it was from reading you know ayn rand and economics and political theory and all this and i think that was primarily who it drew it drew like smart grad student types academics um so they seem to be less radical than we are now, like fewer anarchists, like anarcho-capitalists were like a much smaller percentage of, of libertarians. They were more minarchists and constitutionalist types, but they were also more principled and more well, well better well-read. I think so Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman and those guys were the primary influences that drove it, what we think of as a modern libertarian movement. And then I think Ron Paul happened, and that drew in waves and waves more. But he, So he tended to draw in younger college student types, but mostly – activists people that were activists you know they they thought you could make a change by voting or the electoral politics system uh, and they were also newbies so they they just came in because they heard his message and it resonated but so they weren't the well-read types or the intellectual types but because he was connected to the Mises Institute and Austrian economics the new crop of libertarians that sort of came from that wave I think um, they're less intellectual and well-read Although a lot of them have read some of the basic stuff in Austrian economics, um, but they tend to paradoxically be more anarchist and more – or more favorable to anarchist views and more anti-war, more anti-Fed, and more pro-Austrian economics. So you have a larger group now, not quite as intellectual or well-read as in the past, but, but in a way better libertarians because they're way more uh, cosmopolitan, um, pro-technology, um, you know. And, and and a little bit more radical. That's kind of my take on it. I don't know if other libertarians share that take, but that's what I've seen. And I've, I've been seeing this since about 1982. Right, because um, you know I go back and watch the videos from the 70s and 80s, Murray Rothbard you know, speaking and other luminaries like that. And it was very technical and very historically detailed, uh, You know, like for new liberty and the ethics of liberty. I think a lot of people even modern libertarians would have trouble plowing through that, but they can listen to a podcast where someone explains it simply to them, and that's Correct. fine. And that's Correct. fine. It, Correct. Um, I don't mean I don't mean to be critical of these people. It's just it is a difference. Um, it, it the only part time is frustrating for me is when I'm talking with someone, and they ask these questions, or they try to reinvent the wheel, with complete lack of awareness that this whole this entire debate that they're getting into has been covered. 15 ways by people like 18 years ago and they haven't read it and they're not even aware of it and they don't even think to try to find it and look into it before just hauling off and trying to reinvent the wheel on their own which they're almost never able to do because they don't have the equipment to do it um and all that's even fine is if they would just be humble and say listen I'm dipping my toe into this. There are people who know more than me. I'm going to ask a question, and if they would take a pointer and say, "Okay, you need to go back and think about this and go read A, B, C, and D," and half the time they'll say, "Oh, well, that, don't give me a reading assignment." It's like, okay, well, I mean, do you want to learn or not? You know? It, yeah. I mean, for me, I find the most frustrating aspect of it is. You know, if, if I think someone is worthy of a discussion and they have the capacity for changing their mind, like, well, if, if someone doesn't, I just avoid them. They're just going to waste my time. Maybe you feel the same way about that. But I, I'm often surprised at their lack of curiosity. Correct. Like, in, in, instead of saying, I can't imagine how a voluntary law society would work right. and it's difficult for me, but could you maybe give me some ideas? They immediately go to conclusions, which is like, correct. Uh, like I had a friend that said, look, I just don't support pitchforks and torches. Like, I just don't like it when people, I just don't think att everyone attacking everyone simultaneously is a good idea. Like he immediately went to conclusions like, okay, either this guy thinks I'm a total idiot. Like w we've been friends for years and I, I tell him I'm really passionate about this idea. I've looked a lot into it. And for him to have no curiosity about it is, is frustrating. Well, it's like they want to find an easy way to dismiss it, so they're just trying to get it over with quickly because they they sort of sense that there's a whole body of stuff out there that's too daunting for them to approach, so they don't want to have to feel like they don't know. Um, I don't understand. So if you're if you're even a budding libertarian or interested, you're already adopting a view that's really minority and out of mainstream. You're already taking some risk in a sense. 
you're already kind of made yourself a little bit of a pariah. So why would you even do that if you're not interested in the truth? I mean, you have to have a little bit of desire to learn the truth, to be willing to buck the social, you know, stigma of, 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 of bucking the trends. Um, and so when you meet someone who obviously knows more than you or, sincere, or at least is sincere and seems to have a different perspective, why would you not just ask a real question or listen? Um, the one thing I don't put up with is loaded questions. Now, that comes around two-thirds of the time because people are just not trained in systematic arguing and rational thought, so they don't really realize they're doing it. They will do things – they'll ask compound questions, which is a legal term, but it is – I see why it's in evidence law. Like if you're, uh, if you're uh, the attorney grilling someone on the witness stand – one objection is compound question. What that means is you hit you you just you you hit the, the you hit the witness with three or four questions, so they don't know what to answer. Or like if they answer, which one are they answering? So you have to ask a single question. So that's one thing. Otherwise, you get mixed up and it's it's not clear what you're asking me to answer. So you don't just say, well, what about this and what about this and what about this and what about this? It's like, okay, which one are you asking me? So that's one thing. No compound questions. That means concise, coherent, clear. Which is the way to wisdom, right? If you don't know something, you need to approach it one thing at a time. And also, no loaded questions. That's the worst part. I think people do that unintentionally, but if I call it to their attention and they won't stop and think about it, they're not even – they're either not smart enough or they're not honest enough to, 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 to not want to engage in question begging because that's not the way to truth. Just assuming your conclusions is not a way to truth. So – or for or a sarcastic rhetorical question like… Oh, well, how, how are artists supposed to make money then? It's like they're not really asking me how artists are supposed to make money. What they're saying is in a snide, sarcastic way, I don't think that artists can make money under your system, and that's not acceptable to me, so I reject your system, and so a copyright is needed. That's what their argument is, but they don't want to argue it that way because that would be transparently false or flawed argument. They don't want to mount a whole argument. So if someone is doing that, I don't waste time with them because they don't want to learn. I don't have anything to learn from them, obviously. Uh, the only reason I engage with them is because there are lurkers who listen, and they might they might start realizing, goddamn, everyone who approaches Kinsella about this topic, they always say the same stupid shit. So there must be something they, – they don't have a good argument. So I'm doing it for others to learn. Exactly. Um, and I'm also struck by uh, oftentimes the average – let's say the average – person, they've never been confronted with um, a coherent, non-contradictory set of principles before. They, th they think, and they've been taught um, you know, from public schools and from society that um, it's just got to get more and more complex. Like politics, you need to know these branches of government, and well, and this law happened, and, and this is what the taxes are. And they, they build complexity as opposed to going down to the root. Um, and a lot of people are uncomfortable going down or Correct. upstream. Upstream they can't. and they, they can't and, and and they're used to ad hoc thinking. They're just used to patchwork of thinking. They can deal with only concrete things at a time and kind of in isolation. Which is why when you point out a contradiction in their thought, they don't know what to do. You say, Well, you say this, but you also say this, and those two are not compatible. You need to choose one of them. And they're like, uh, I want both. <laughs> it, and some people it seems like a personality type, they find um uh consistency and rationality very freeing um like i've heard the analogy you know once you put the the sun at the center of the solar system all of this erratic behavior that made no sense and had needed ad hoc explanations suddenly it all made perfect sense and um, to me putting the individual at the center of society suddenly everything makes sense everything that we hate in like all the things that suck generally speaking schools uh roads police courts the legal system the the uh, corrupted money supply, wars, who controls all those things? Well, a violent monopoly. Um, but uh, I guess my question would be, like, do you have some syllogisms or clincher arguments? If you're in a very short, if time is in a short supply and you're debating with someone, do you have a list of things in your head that you pull from that are clincher arguments? Oh, it's, it's, it's just so, it depends on the context. And I try, I try to make one piece of progress when I can, you know, like I just have to see what they, where they're rational and, and, and go with that. Um, 
and usually that involves trying to find a common premise that we share, you know, a common value or a co something that we all agree on. Like, okay, do you agree that Earth is round at least? <laughs> you know, um, do, you, do you agree that we know that there is a sun? <laughs> um, or, or, or really in ethics, I'll say, okay, listen, do you think it's wrong to hit people who don't deserve it? Or do you think it's wrong to murder people? Do you, can we at least agree on that? And, you know, once you establish a shared premise, now, there are some misanthropes out there. Now, I'm not usually talking to these people, serial murderers and total sociopaths. Um, but you have some people that are sort of um, contrarians in argument, and they will pretend like they're a sociopath. Like they'll say, yeah, I just want what's good for me. It's like, well, if you're really serious about that, then you've just declared yourself to be my enemy because what you're saying is you'll use me as a means to your end if you need to. So you don't respect my rights. So if it comes down to it, you and I are enemies. So this conversation is purely strategic for both of us. So I'm just going to keep an eye on you. Like you're not going to be invited to my house, and if we ever get trapped on a desert island together, I might have to kill you when you're sleeping, right? I mean, <laughs> to save myself for when you wake up tomorrow and try to kill me first. Um, but these people aren't usually serious. They're just trying to be gadflies or, or provocative. You know, uh, they don't want to concede that they really do value. I mean, they do value peace and knowledge if they're having a conversation with you. They don't want to concede that because they're afraid if they concede something, then they'll be trapped. Uh, they'll be trapped by the truth. I don't know why people are afraid of being trapped by the truth, but uh, so I can't think of any kind of a uh, go-to knockdown argument. Uh, but when I see one, I'll go for it. I'm not afraid to. I know a lot of liber these left libertarian types. Uh, that that type tends to, you know, the kind of respectable mainstream incremental uh, moderate libertarians, the, you know, the utilitarians, the ones with no principles, they seem to think that knockdown arguments are coercive, right? Because they trap you and all this kind of stuff. It's like, well, sorry. Um, it's the same kind of person that says something like, uh, well, there are no absolute truths whatsoever. And I'm like, what about what you just said? Right. And they all that, but for some reason that retort never works. They always look at you and say, "Well, you're just being silly." It's like, "Well, but okay, I just showed you logically a flaw in what you just said," and they just don't care. You know, um, you know, in my early days getting into this, I would notice that my email debates would go paragraphs after paragraph after paragraph. I would have to unpack. Um, historical context and things like that. And I've noticed over time, um, my arguments have become a little bit more efficient where uh, someone would, would type you know, a page of, of garbage and you just call out the contradiction and the thinking there and all it would take is a sentence or three. Um, and I find that that helps with the stamina of it. And, and most people will concede the point or give up the, the, the conversation. Um, so it's like a boxer with, um, who's very smooth as opposed to just throwing punches all the time and having to know everything about everything constantly. Um, cool. Uh, thoughts on, sorry to keep this um, philosophical, okay. but um, do, I can, do, do whatever you want. I, I can't help myself. Um, now I know that this is not a priori either way, or some people might argue it, but is voting defensive or, or should an anarchist not vote? What, what's your thoughts on that? Um, that's a difficult issue. Uh, I guess I don't have a, a I don't have a strong opinion about that. Um, I certainly don't think voting is necessary, or it's Im I don't think it's immoral not to vote. Um, personally, I go back and over the years I've gone back and forth. My first vote was eighty four. I voted for Reagan. I was registered Democrat because my dad from Louisiana. My dad said we're Democrats. I'm like, okay, because we're we're for the we're for the little guy. And I didn't know what the hell that meant. But he was always voting Republican. So to, so I voted Reagan my first time, and then ever since then I voted Libertarian, um, except this last election. <laughs> um, and uh, when I voted, but there was as many years I just don't vote because I think voting is futile, right? Um, on the other hand, I have this theory of causation, right? Where uh, you, you, one of my articles, causation and aggression, you have to, we have to identify who is responsible for acts of aggression. So, because libertarians were ultimately opposed to acts of aggression, and one one type of aggression is that committed by the state, which means institutionalized aggression or the force of law, and the state 
the state's apparatus enforces that. So you could say the state's responsible, but we as individual as libertarians, we have to look for an individual. So who's responsible, really? It's a bunch of people, you know, it's the president, it's the governors, it's the legislators, it's the judges, it's the jailers, the cops. Um, in a sense, in the in the in the American system, in the Anglo system, where there's a jury trial system in the criminal system, I almost think like the most responsible person for a for for an act of state aggression is the juror. Because the juror has like um, the ultimate discretion to do whatever they want. Because you can vote to convict, you can vote not guilty or innocent in a trial of someone who's convicted of a of a of a um, of a victimless crime. Um, you don't have you don't have any uh, you don't have any uh, uh, pressure, or you don't have you don't you're not required to vote guilty. So if you vote guilty, that's on you. So I almost think the juror is the most responsible person in society when people are in prison for non for for non libertarian crimes. Um, I mean, because yeah, you could blame the police or the jailer or the judge, but or the or the legislator. But if you fire them, they're just going to be replaced by the same kind of person, right? Um, so in that same vein, you could also blame the voters because the legislators are going to be there if they're voted in by the voters. So it's really not the legislators' fault either. It's the voters. But the nature of this sort of prisoner's dilemma game theory system we have with democracy means that even the voters at, at a certain point, you have no choice but try to fight for your slice of the pie because it's a war of all against all. That's what democracy causes. So I don't know if there's a really moral – we're almost in a state of war against all. We're not in a state of peace because of democracy. So I don't know if peace is possible, which is sort of a precondition for rights. Um, I mean, I tend to think as a good person, you should try to aspire to your ideals and try to vote for libertarian stuff, even if it hurts you personally. You know, like my libertarian half my libertarian friends are getting PPP payments right now because of COVID. They're enjoying getting the free money. They can even argue they're entitled to it as restitution because they're the they're the most victimized people in society. <coughs> so should they vote to end PPP payments? Yeah, as libertarians, they should. But would it hurt their interest? Yeah, I mean, I'm a patent lawyer. I want to abolish the patent system. Should I? Should I just be quiet and accept the the money I get, the free ill-got money I got, I get for the patent system, uh, and not criticize it, even though I know it's wrong? So you have these dilemmas. I don't know how to, the best way to answer them in a systematic way. Uh, I'm, I'm not a comprehensive ethicist. Um, I just go by common sense, intuition, and I've learned some things about how they they intersect with and they 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 stem off of political ethics. Um, so in the end, my view is. Uh, if you vote, you should vote. Uh, you should vote for the better, the, le the least bad candidate. And I do think that you could call that defensive voting. And I think, in that case, if your motive is to elect someone who seems to do the least harm, then even if that person you elect ends up doing evil, I don't know if you're exactly responsible. Um, Wendy McElroy, who's a good friend of mine, argues the opposite. She thinks you're responsible. I think she argues that. Um, well, she says she has an article why I would not vote for Hitler. Uh, I'm sorry, why I would not vote against Hitler. Um, it's pretty easy to defend the first, <laughs> the first uh, uh, proposition. Uh, she, I think she argues that you're responsible for whatever the person does that you help put in power. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the causal connection is so tenuous. You can say no. It's really more important what you say. I think because what you say has a more uh, has more of a, of a causal connection because voting is binary. You know. If I vote for, for Biden and he doesn't win, then I didn't cause him to get elected. Uh, and if I vote for Biden and he does win, then my vote didn't cause him to get elected either. But it's the incremental effect of that signal like, oh, Biden, Biden got one more vote, so that means he's got more support. So that has an effect. But speaking out has even more of an effect, you know, like putting a bumper sticker on my car or telling people go vote for Biden. Um, to me, that's even more that's even more causally responsible. So you have gradations of responsibility. Um, when I was a grad student type, you know, we would salivate over the idea of we us coming getting victory someday and having a libertarian Nuremberg war crimes tribunal and Rothbard and Kinsella and Hop would be on it. We would we would send some people to the to the to the gas chamber uh, to the to the guillotine and some to prison. You know, kind of these stupid fantasies. Uh, of course, I, I think that you'd have to have a spectrum of responsibility, just like they did in Nuremberg. You know, the guards were one thing, and then the the, the top commanders were another. I think ultimately, if we can achieve victory, we just call it even. Let everyone go. Try to live a peaceful life going forward, except for maybe you know Donald Rumsfeld and those types. But um, 
not school teachers who voted for Biden. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I wonder if, if our whole job moving forward is to just continue to bring the conversation forward in the most coherent um, and respectable way possible. Because if we're, you know, we've all met libertarians who are just happy to insult you, you know, right off the bat and immediately go into the against me argument, which- Oh, what do you, not, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Explain that one. Uh, you, you'll see certain people that immediately go to, oh, so I should go to jail. Um, so you want me to put be put in jail for doing something, for not paying taxes or something like that. And I think there's a valid place to, to put that argument, but it comes a little bit later um, if a person still is unwilling to, to, to go to reason, to go into the against me argument. Yeah, they're, they're, I think what they're doing is they're trying to deflect because they're putting it in an uncharitable or in an or in a, or in a emotionally fraught way. The better way to put it would be, so you're saying that I'm, I'm condoning or participating in an act of aggression, which is unjust. And I would say, yes, that's what I'm saying. I think aggression is unjustified, unjustified and you're condoning it. You shouldn't do that. Stop doing it. And then they say, oh, so you want me to go to jail? It's like, well. I'm trying to say that we should aggression is unjustified and you shouldn't support it. What how you should be treated if you engage in it is a second question. We can go into that, but really I'd prefer you not do it. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so there's obviously gray areas for any society. Um, and there's again, no perfectly a priori way to answer all these things. Do, do you have a list of uh, things that you consider gray areas of? Uh, uh, let's see. In libertarianism, yeah. um, yeah, I think there are some tough issues or difficult issues. Um, actually, um, this part, slightly off point, but I think Bob Murphy on his podcast recently, he did a three-part series. I don't know if he cl concluded it yet, but it's something like Things I've Learned, and he went through things he um, he changed his mind on. I'm thinking about doing that myself because um, there's really not that many. Um, and also I'm thinking about doing one on like – things I think I've made a contribution for, like just highlight the things I think I've found little nuggets of things where I've advanced the theory a little bit just to highlight and identify them, then help me remember, and maybe I can work on more of them. Um, and I'm also working on like this talk I did at Porkfest was on the libertarian constitution. And I'm so I'm trying to think about coming up with like a, a systematic, comprehensive, but but conceptual statement of libertarian principles. And in that, I want to identify what, what are the, more of the black letter issues or the, 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 the issues that really are not that debatable uh, that are established or that I think are, 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 are clear. Um, and then that would require identifying the gray areas, right? So like some people think intellectual property is a gray area or is an or is a, is a, is a area of debate. I don't think so at all. I think it's clear. I understand some people don't understand it yet, but I think if you – I think it follows – I think the drug war and intellectual property are actually the two easiest and clearest issues of all among libertarianism. Those two follow most directly from the non-aggression principle and from our property rights principles, and there is just simply no argument for the drug war or intellectual property at all. All the other big things that we think are evil as libertarians, like war, taxation, government schools, the Federal Reserve, um, what am I missing? Um, welfare, uh, taxation. There are some arguments for all of those. Now, principled libertarians, especially anarchist libertarians, don't agree with any of those either. But you could say that, well, war is justified in the case of an attack on the nation. If it's purely defensive, right? And taxation is necessary if you're a minarchist because you have to have some funding for this minimal state, um, and you need a Federal Reserve because of some Hayekian theory. You know, so, some come, some of the the, the the Milton Friedman type theories of uh, of how economics works and the money supply works. So there are some arguments. I think they're all flawed, but there are some arguments, and they're not they're not dishonest arguments. But IP and drug war, there are just no arguments. <laughs> there really are. Um, Putting someone in a cage for ingesting a substance you don't like. It's just there is no argument for that. Okay. And um, now, what about other issues? So I think the abortion issue is one that is a continuum issue, at least. And also, I don't know if you call it a gray area, but it's, it's something that's interminable. It's really difficult to decide. Walter Block tends to try to 
when he encounter he hates these these gray areas. So what he does is he calls them continuums. But I don't know if they're all continuums. I think some things are just beyond the the beyond the the realm of law. You have to at some point just say so. Like for abortion, my solution. Is, I mean, I have my own opinions about abortion. I I, I do ultimately I'm pro-choice, but like reluctantly because I, as a as a human who values life. And as a libertarian who, who opposes aggression, I do think that at a certain point, humans reach the point where we attribute rights to them and you know, hurting them is aggression and not only immoral but murder or homicide. But I think we can reasonably say that that happens somewhere late term in the, in, in the pregnancy, not just after the baby's born. However, to police that and to make it illegal… Would require such intrusiveness into a private domain of the family and the woman and the mother and her body, and also as technology goes on day by day, it's going to become increasingly impossible to police it because you know a woman might be in a cabin, pregnant for nine months, no one even knows, and she has a robot in her basement that, that has the abortion, no one even knows. So it's just a private thing that's no one's business. Um, furthermore, I think the problem is going to disappear over time because as we get richer and more humane. And more advanced, all, all the stigmas from being from sex are going to go away, and the being pregnant is not going to be a stigma, and the mark of her adoption will be high. Um, I think women will just stop having abortions because if you get pregnant on accident, you either have a very very early term abortion or or you just you you, you take it out of your uterus for three months and put it into an incubator and you give it to someone else. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to be a problem in the, in the long run. Um, but what I would say, so my solution is. The jurisdiction over that, yeah, let's call it homicide, a late-term abortion. Let's say it's homicide. I'm not sure it is, but let, you can make an argument for that. I think that, that in that case, we just say the jurisdiction over that is the mother herself or the family. That's where the jurisdictional unit is, and that that's compatible with anarchy, which is sort of decentralizing things down to the individual unit. So because of its nature, it's the thing where the community – it's none of the community's business, right? Although you could see – Extreme ostracism and shunning effects if people are aware of someone who is a horrible person who is just routinely aborting eight and a half month old fetuses when they don't need to. I mean, they're going to suffer severe rep reputational effects, if nothing else, um, if, if people know about it. So that's kind of my take. So abortion maybe is one gray area. Um, some of the cl some of the things that were the property rights are difficult to to. Uh, to identify and establish like airways in the in the air, ocean navigation rights, uh, water rights, uh, rights over roving animals, uh, rights over uh, fle fleeing minerals underground where you have the, uh, the um, uh, different rules about uh, uh, whether you can take minerals out from someone – your neighbor's property or whether uh, they, they share in the pool. Um, things like that are difficult. Um, and of course, lifeboat situations. But my solution to all these is is like, yeah, you can dream up scenarios where the answer is difficult to deduce from our armchair as libertarian theorists, and maybe there is no solution. Um, however, it could just be a case of of, of, a, of a situation where peace is not possible, and there's going to be tragedy. Tragedy is possible. And in in any case, the question is a relative one, like. OK, libertarianism can't solve the problem of two guys on an island or two guys in the desert with one bottle of water between them. Libertarianism can't solve that problem. But how would socialism solve it? <laughs> how would fascism solve it? How would theocracy solve it? Ne ne just adopting a different political philosophy can't make another bottle of water that solves the problem. So these criticisms of libertarianism have to be taken in context. It's like just because libertarianism can't do everything doesn't mean that it's flawed. Um, libertarianism is simply a, a, a considered, well thought out, sincere response to the question in a world of scarcity where there's potential conflict, where humans want to live among each other because they benefit from it, but where there's a danger from living with each other because of conflict. Um, we need to assign property rights to things so that people can live in peace when they want to try. And we have to do that in the most reasonable, fair way possible, and libertarianism attempts to do that. Anything more than that cannot be asked from a political philosophy. Very well said. Um, 
Yeah, when I say difficult parts or gray areas for libertarian philosophy, um, that does not obviously imply that the government is the best way to solve that. It's just given our framework, here are yeah. the things that we just can't decide. And um, well, I guess the market would decide um, and what better solution than the, than the market for these things? I uh, think one one more. Let me add one more thing. One more thing would be a punishment theory, which I've written on. So I actually think punishment and retaliation itself, revenge. Uh, I think it is justified. Um, I think that is what justice can mean in some cases, in theory, in principle, right? So I think that if someone commits a severe act of violence against you uh, or your family member, that person, um, it would be just for that person to be punished, even executed um, in some cases. That said, I think a realistic, practical world uh, system in society for doing that is extremely unlikely and difficult because um, that is for it to be institutionalized. You know, if a family member or a victim goes, uh, goes uh, dirty hairy and just takes the guy out in an act of vigilante justice, you know, that's going to happen from time to time. And I think society's going to just they're going to kind of nod their head and let it pass they're going to say okay he took out the trash the guy might get ostracized for doing that if he does it too much he's going to become a loose cannon even though he's a victim he's he's also not following the law which is to bring a dispute to your peers and let the system handle it so that you're not biased you're not a jury you're not a judge in your own case you don't over punish because you know you're making all that you're the judge jury and executioner all these things make it make self-help dangerous so I think self-help would always be an option for for actual self-defense, which it even is in today's state-dominated legal system, right? In the common law, everyone admits that you have the right to use lethal force in self-defense uh, when the police can't be called, you know, when it's too late. Um, so in that case, you are acting as judge, jury, and executioner. But what else are you going to do? You know. Um, so I think that in the real world. You would tend to have a restitution system and an ostracism system because the cost of implementing an institutional punishment system is so high because there's no benefit and there's all cost. There's no benefit because no one benefits from this except the victim psychologically benefits. But who's going to pay for who's going to pay for the elevated costs of the? You have to have a higher burden of proof. You have to satisfy to kill someone rather than to take money from them, like beyond a reasonable doubt instead of preponderance of the evidence. Um, you have to have lots of insurance standing by because what if you punish an, someone who turns out to be innocent later? Now you've committed aggression. So I just think because of this, no one's going to get involved in this business in an institutionalized way. I almost have come down to the view that jail or prison should be almost abolished in any society, and it should be reserved only for the – like basically if anyone deserves to be in prison, they should just be killed. Like if, if they're so bad that they deserve to be in prison, it's because they're basically a complete misanthrope and sociopath and a standing threat to everyone. And in that case, they should just be sent to Australia or – or, or uh, Coventry, as Robert Heinlein described it, um, or dropped in the middle of the ocean, or just killed. I mean, um, but other than that, I think give people a chance to reintegrate back into society, pay their debts, or they're be, going to be shunned and they're going to live. A, they're going to be left as outlaws and sort of a, a marginal problem. So those are difficult issues. There's no deductive a priori answer to this, but it's a guess based upon our knowledge of the way the law works now, the way things have been done in history, and our knowledge of libertarian principles. That's what I think would and should happen in a free society. Right, and um, establishing an institution where a person um, can get into power, uh, police officers, um, uh, uh, guard guards in prisons, and um, and uh, soldiers in war have an opportunity to be unbelievably cruel um, to, to people. So removing the opportunity to be unbelievably cruel without um, any sort of consequence would be step one. Um, cool. And uh, just the last thing on the gray areas is um, I've always wondered about the, the animal rights question. And it's I was, about, I was about to say that. Yeah, I was about to say animal rights is another one. Yeah, unbelievably difficult. But um, as you mentioned before, technology sometimes can solve these problems for us. And maybe it was you that mentioned this, uh, but I think it's really interesting, the idea of synthetic meat. That, yes. you know, if, if I had to pay double the cost of meat or triple the cost of meat to get a synthetic one that wasn't from an animal that was killed, I would definitely do that. And if I was a billionaire, if I was Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, or Bill Gates, I would, 
I would give $10 billion to research and growing synthetic meat. Um, and a lot of people say, ooh, that's so gross. Like something cultured in a lab yeah, or yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah. Well, what's grosser than a fuck slaughterhouse? Excuse my language. Um, well, what's I mean, you're eating an animal's flesh. I mean, that, that's gross too, if you think about it. Some, people still do that, right? I mean, you know, uh, someone says, oh, I have hog's head cheese. It's made from the brain. You know, oh, disgusting. It's like, okay, well, they eat it in one country or one region and you eat. You know, you eat their leg muscles. I mean, what's the difference, really? Um, I, yeah, I think animal rights is more of an ethical question than than a uh, political question. Although the animal rights question is interesting, so I personally think that rights have to have some connection to our capacity for rationality. Um, I, I, I'm prone towards Lauren Lamasky's view of what he calls piggybacking, which is how, why we say that. Not fully functioning humans also have rights like people with dementia or in comas or vegetables or children or babies or infants. Why do we attribute rights to them? And he has he says, well, we extend our rights in a social way from the normal functioning adult case or even even someone who's taking a nap, someone sleeping, you know, or someone who's enduring surgery. They're, they're knocked out. Um, we attribute rights to them. But I think that that just can't go to animals. Now, in principle, animals could have rights if they develop enough rationality. Like I think basically it's reciprocity. If an animal can respect your rights, then you can respect his. I think Leonard Peikoff one time said – someone said, why, why don't mosquitoes have rights? And he said, well, when they petition for them, they can have them. You know, um, And I think there are some animals that probably – could evolve into into sapients uh, like cetaceans and maybe some apes if we would let them we're probably not going to let them we're probably going to short circuit their evolution i don't know i don't know how that works um dinosaurs may be of may, may have evolved by now if the, if the meteors hadn't wiped them out um and there may be there may be life in outer space that is sapient and, and they would have rights too so humans have rights but by human we just mean sapient creatures and so far as we know we're the only ones that have that um, but there are some animals that come so close, you know, that I think it's so. It, it'd be like aborting a, a baby at three months. You know, you, you might have a right to, but it's kind of icky. It's a potential life, and if you're a parent, you start seeing that. My, my views on abortion did change a little when my wife got pregnant because you think, God, that's my baby in there. Because you do call it your baby, and you want it to protect it, you know. So you start realizing it's a potential human life, or it is a human life. Um, but on the on the ethics issue, I totally agree. I think that if we could, uh, it's a little bit of an elitist first world view, though. Like you said, like oh, I would double, I would pay twice as much. Yeah, you would, and I would. I, I think you can't expect poor people in India or Africa or whatever to to do that. Not yet. Um, but yes, if you could afford it and you could stop the suffering and misery of animals, and also it'd probably be better for the environment and everything, right? Uh, and the I assume the meat would be better eventually, right? It'd be uniform. You could you could clone the best one, have the, the 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 wagyu beef, super beef prime. I imagine that's coming someday, and I do think that in a world like that, there'd be very little excuse to kill animals except for medical experimentation, which I still think we should do if it's necessary because human life is still more important than animal life. But we should be humane and all that. So I, I agree with all. That. I used to be a hunter and I quit hunting because I hated killing animals. Uh, I just didn't enjoy it. I don't think it's immoral to eat them for food, but it, it would be nicer if we could if we could have meat without killing animals. Yeah, I, I quit going hunting with my dad and brother um, because I just felt terrible about it. But I'm obviously a hypocrite because I still eat meat. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. All right. Let's move a little bit more into the bizarro territory um, and uh, aesthetic questions and so on. Um, and you just let me know when you have to go. Uh, so do you think AI at a sufficient complexity will actually have consciousness, subjective of consciousness? Um, I think it could, uh, and that's an interesting question for – I talked to Walter Block about this before. Um, in my theory, which is drawn on Hoppe's uh, about rights, so there are two types of property rights. One is the property right in your body, and one is the property right in other things. You – and they're different because you have to own your body and be a, uh, an actor, be a human being that can move around the world to homestead other things. So you homestead – you own other things in the world by, by using them first and by, by, by putting a border or a boundary around them somehow to denote your ownership. 
but you can only do that if you already own your body. So the first thing is your, your ownership of your body, but you don't own that by homesteading it because there's no actor to homestead it, right? So it's sort of a chicken and the egg thing. I think the reason you own your body is because of your – you have – so the what's, what's in common with all the theories of ownership is that it's whoever has the best link to the thing, the best objectively demonstrable – a connection to the thing that they could show other people so they could say, I have the best connection to this thing, so you should respect my property rights in it so we can have peace and avoid conflict. So in the case of external things, the first link the, – the best link is the first person to use it for, for obvious reasons uh, because we can't survive unless we use things, which means someone has to be the first one to use it, so they have to have permission to use it so it's not unethical and so it's permissible. Which means that the first use is something special. So that's the that's why that's the best link. But in the case of your body, I think the best link is your direct control over your body. I'm the only one who can move my hand. I so I have a direct control over this body. That gives me a special connection to this body that that separates me apart from everyone else who claims to own my body. And everyone else who claims to own my body also directly controls their body. So they're relying upon this premise too. In their assertion of their self ownership rights, so it's sort of like an undeniable thing that everyone is presumptively the owner of their own body because they can control it. Now, if that's the case, if we had a, a computer system, um, let's say I own a computer, a mainframe computer at my house, which is running a program, an AI program. I own that hardware, but if I program a program on there that wakes up someday and becomes self aware and is intelligent and conscious and has what we call sapience. And therefore has rights, then that computer has now acquired ownership of that of that body, that computer. So now I own that computer, and now the ownership has been transferred to that to that robot. Just like my baby, like if I'm a mother and there's a baby in my body, say one month old, those cell tissues are in my body. They came from my body. I own those. But at the point where the fetus has rights, he sort of wakes up and he. I won't say homesteads, but he acquires ownership of those products. So the mother loses ownership of those cells that were in her body that she owned the day before, and now they're owned by the fetus or the baby. Same thing with the robot. So now as a technical matter, I am extremely skeptical of AI. Um, I certainly don't think real AI is anywhere around the corner. I, I'm thinking 50 years from now, something like that. I could be wrong. I also believe that it's impossible to program AI. I think the only way to get AI is for it to grow. So I think you could you could someday manufacture a synthetic neural network, a digital electronic neural network with sufficient complexity and neural structure uh, on the order of complexity of the human brain, and then you can design it so that it can start learning patterns, and maybe it could evolve consciousness. But once it does, the processes inside are going to be so mysterious, you won't understand that any better – than our brain, with one exception, and that is because it's digital, we would have complete information about everything going on in, inside of it in a, in, in a causal sense. So we could map the internal goings on of, of this neural brain better than we can map the contents of our wet brains, and then we that would give us psychological and other neuro neuropsychological insights into the way that this artificial brain works. Uh, we still we would still have to have some philosophy of mapping all this. Which I think is not a hard science and never will be, um, unless we have an AI that's so hyper intelligent that it can figure it out for us. <clears throat> My other thoughts on AI is that I don't know if super intelligence is possible. I do think artificial intelligence is possible, but I, I don't know if super intelligence is possible. I do think there are probably limits to intelligence because just like we can only hold so many concepts in our mind at one time before we just become psychotic or fall apart, I think that's just the nature of a conscious system. Um, so I think that if you had an AI brain, it could be smarter than us because it's faster. Like it can run at 10,000 times or a million times the speed of our brains. On the other hand, that might make it go insane within two seconds, you know, because if you had to live a billion years watching everyone move in slow motion around you, you'd probably go insane. So maybe, maybe these things go insane after a microsecond. I don't know. But theoretically, so I think you would just slow the clock down so they run near our speed. So you're going to have. AIs that are as smart as us, uh, they probably have better memories, <coughs> uh, access to bigger memories, but I don't know if they're going to be that much smarter than us. Uh, but I do think that they could be um, – they could have rights, and that's going to cause some problems because what if the internet wakes up? Now, that means this, this new, this new uh, Skynet owns the entire 
a set of computers and hardware and transmission lines all around the world, and now we're in a pickle. So I think we have to be careful uh, putting too much faith in our ownership rights in, in, in dead resources that might someday become the body of a, of a, of, of a waking up super robot. But I think right. this is 50, 50 years down the road. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so I'm skeptical of the idea that um, computation can create subjective consciousness. Um, and so that sort of sidesteps the question of will these things have rights? Because if they don't actually have a subjective experience and they're just complex enough to do unbelievably great problem solving. Um, why, why, why are you skeptical? Why, why do you think computation can? I mean, our brains, that's what our brains do is computation, right? It's wet. It's wet computation, or analog. Right. right. So um, I, I've been looking into um, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff's theory of consciousness, which you you may be familiar with. But um, their theory is that consciousness is due to the collapse of the wave function at the quantum mm. level, mm. Um, mm. and microtubules inside the brain are a way to orchestrate those things coherently. Mm. So in a sense that. Uh, they believe in panpsychism, which is mm -hmm. the, the universe has a proto consciousness across mm -hmm. all things. And mm -hmm. our brains are conscious, not because they're computational. Now they happen to have computational aspects to them, which allows us to have a coherent mm -hmm. um, strategy into the world. But just because we replicate complexity in transistors does not mean they have subjective consciousness because there are no microtubules to mm -hmm. have a subjective experience with. And th the reason I bring this up is if we truly believe that AI is subjectively conscious and we send a robot to Mars and then it runs out of power, we just killed something of, of astounding intelligence or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying we really need to have a conversation about will AI have subjective consciousness? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, we can actually sidestep a lot of the ethical issues. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. And if Penrose, I, I've, I've just read a little bit into this stuff. It's, it's interesting. It's, it, to my mind, this is not real science. It's like Omni Magazine stuff, um, partly because at the edges of these science things, they become basically unverifiable or untestable, I think. I, I could be wrong. Maybe there's ways you could do it. I mean there's this book by John Horgan, The End of Science, about 15 years ago, which is fascinating. He talks about how like you're getting to the point where it's so hard to test something like string theory and these multidimensional theories. I, they're, they're nice ways of framing it and thinking about it, but at a certain point, it's like it's not really true or false. It's just a way of organizing the data. Um, I, I'm personally skeptical of all this kind of stuff, um, partly because I'm skeptical of quantum physics itself. I'm an electrical engineer. I know there's quantum tunneling and, and Zener diodes and that kind of stuff, but I just think that's the way we describe what's happening. I don't believe in quantum computing. I don't believe in quantum phenomena. I'm more of a realist and a causal realist and a, even more of a Randian on this stuff. I could be wrong, but I'm deeply skeptical of the idea of randomness and quantum, quantum the way we the way we interpret what is it called? The Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics. I think all the, I think, and I think there are some dissident physicists who also disagree or they used to. Um, so I'm skeptical of this, this entire quantum framework. Um, I don't believe in parallel universes um, as a philosophical matter, because I, I think to exist means to have an effect on other things. So if you posit a dimension or a realm that in principle is not detectable or has no effect on us and vice versa, it doesn't literally, it literally does not exist. It's like when you tell a story, oh, Jack and the Beanstalk. I mean, that's just a story. So if you say, okay, there's another universe next to ours, but we can't see each other and, and we exist in parallel, that's just a complicated way of saying it doesn't exist, um, I think. Now, that's my philosophical way of dealing with it. Um, and this, in this field, I am reinventing the wheel a little bit, being a crank, but that's because everyone I read, I'm dissatisfied with. I'm dissatisfied with physicists who plays philosopher, like Fritjof Capra and that ridiculous, the Tao of physics, um, and other physicists who try to get philosophical and they're amateurs at it, or they haven't read what I think is the right stuff. And then, you know, you have the a priori, the people with their theories, like Ayn Rand and these others, and they have their theories and they just stick with them no matter what the evidence. So I'm in a pickle as what to believe, but I, I tend towards a, a real a realist view of things where I believe in causality and I do not I'm skeptical, deeply skeptical of quantum stuff. Um, so I see no reason why you couldn't have <coughs> uh, an AI computer unless consciousness requires analog and not digital. But maybe you could make an analog electrical, uh, digital, uh, an analog uh, uh, electronic neural network. 
right? Uh, but I, I don't know. I am deeply skeptical of AI. I, I, I guess I agree with you to a certain extent. I don't think you can program it. So I, I would say that any program is just um, uh, it's just a uh, uh, it's just a program following the rules of its creator. It's not really conscious. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, I, I see people conflate the, the two concepts of extremely powerful AI is necessarily conscious. And um, yeah, I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Um, let's keep going down the rabbit hole of just weird things. Um, what do you think of UFOs, aliens? Do you think they've visited us? No, I do not. Um, I think we're probably, I think we, we, we very well could be alone in the universe. Um, I think when people say it's likely there's life in outer space, I don't think they know what they're talking about. I think they don't understand probability. Um, all we know is that we exist. And that, that fact is, is compatible with life being extremely unlikely or life being common. So the fact that we exist tells us nothing about which one is likely. I think all these, uh, these uh, <laughs> D&D type <laughs> dorm room, grad, grad school dorm room session things like, oh, we could be living in a simulation are complete and utter bullshit and nonsense. And I'm informed in this by sort of my appreciation for aspects of Ayn Rand's theory of uh, concept formation and epistemology and validation of knowledge, especially the way David Kelly presents it in his great uh, 1980s series, which I have on my, my YouTube channel. I have a playlist. I think it's called the Foundations of Knowledge. Um, I'm blocking my COVID cough, cough from everyone. Hold on. Um, it's sort of a way of looking at what certain knowledge is and what knowledge in general is. Um, and in particular, it's his talk on skepticism. Like most people have this kind of simplistic continuum theory, like, oh, we can have, they're almost empiricists, right? sort of the one problem I have with the modern atheists, I'm an atheist, but I'm not their type of atheist, like these modern secular atheists like Dawkins and Hitchens and Sam Harris. These guys all tend to just be empiricists. Like they'll say, well, there's no evidence yet for God. So we're 99.9% .9 certain there's no God. I don't think they have a sophisticated theory of concept of, of knowledge. Uh, that's not how you approach things. Um, I think that's totally wrong. I think that the Randian view is correct. Like, if someone makes an assertion about something that's possible, even that is an assertion of knowledge about the way the universe is, and that requires some reason or evidence. And you can't just say, "Well, anything's possible," because not we don't know that anything is possible, right? Um, I think we can have contextual certainty in the in this in the assertion that there is no God, for several reasons. Number one, um, the term is never defined accurately enough to have any coherent content so it's a meaningless assertion it's like saying blah exists the statement blah exists is not true because it's not saying anything that's one thing anyway there's lots of arguments like that so the closest i found to a rational discussion of it is george smith but even he is is has something wanting so um how do we get on the god issue um um well, we were talking well, ufos uh, oh ufos so so i so it so it gets to the probability of ufos um and as as I understand, my understanding of science and 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 astro you know astrophysics, it, I mean it's I I don't know if we'll ever colonize the galaxy, much less the universe because it's just so difficult to get up just to get to the moon, um, and you know these systems have to be more and more and more and more complex to do more and more things, and the more complex they are, the more chance they crash. I mean the, we had two space shuttles crash, you know. Um, you know, you have a little uh, marble-sized piece of space junk hitting the space shuttle. It's gonna, it's gonna destroy it. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. Um, and I think it's just ridiculous. I think if, if, if life in outer space had been here by now, you would have a lot of it, and we'd know it. So no, I don't believe any of it. I don't, I don't think there's ever been life in outer space that's been here. Uh, and I think all the reports of the best explanation is either we don't know. Or it's just some natural explanation. That's that's my take on it. But I'm 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 a deeply um, uh, non-typical libertarian in that I'm I almost have like a a, a, a constitutional aversion to uh, to conspiracy theories and things like that. <laughs> um, unlike most of my libertarian friends. Um,
So no, that's my view on UFOs. What, what do you think? Um, I would not put my interest in UFOs at the same level of coherence as my anarcho-libertarian theories, but um, having really dived into a lot of the multi-people um, experiences and a lot of the nuclear bases that everyone reports the exact same thing. There was a thing hovering there. It shut down the entire base that um, I tend to believe that um, uh, we're being visited by something that um, is not openly trying to interact with us and may have some sort of s somewhat slightly uh, economic interest in our survival, whether it be they sometimes pull our DNA um, and use us, or they at least don't want to destroy us, um, or they don't want us to destroy ourselves. But, um, you know, by the way, I, I don't think those theories are crazy. I think they're actually possible. I just think that we can't be sure of that until we have good evidence. I, I just think the best, the question for me is an Occam's razor thing. What's the best explanation for these, these reports and these sightings? Is it a theory like yours for which we have no, really no evidence, or is it is it just we don't know or or what? Because it just seems to me there's so many problems with your theory that we would need a lot of evidence to really be be at all sure of that. But that, that would be my take on it. Yeah, that's cool. Um, you know, uh, again, I wouldn't put it on the same level as the um, philosophical certainty of uh, individual freedom and, and liberty and stuff. But uh, I, th I think it's interesting. Um, I would. I'd be interested in having a conversation with you maybe five years from now and see if you've changed your mind on yeah. this. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe you're not interested. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm a mildly, I used look, I, when I was a kid, I was interested in all this stuff. I pyramid power, UF, you know, UFOs. Uh, I try, I tried black magic and stuff, you know, when I was a teenager, you know, I, I was interested in all this stuff uh, until I read Rand and became a hyper rationalist robot. Yeah. I, I rarely meet objectivists. Um, I don't know if their influence in the community or popularity is 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 going down or not. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, along the lines of our earlier talk, uh, I think that, um, like I said, I think probably a good two thirds of all libertarians now are just not that well read in our origins, right? So yeah, I meet people all the time who astonishingly are not that familiar with Ayn Rand. Um, not that I think she's essential. But a lot of her thought has permeated lots of the foundations of libertarianism, and when you go through that and you read her critics and her responses and people she influenced, you realize the deep tapestry of stuff that we figured out, and you'd be more aware of things that have been already hashed out and discussed. Um, so I think it's important for – I'm not saying I'm – I'm not even saying – I'm not even – I think I would be a Randian by her original abstract statement of what objectivism is, which is just four principles, right? Reality. I believe in that um, um, egoism, which is self-interest. It's hard to disagree with that. Uh, capitalism, which I think call libertarianism, and um, what's the other one? Well, so we can know reality, and that there's a reality that exists. That those kind of things. I agree with all that, but I, I disagree with her application of her politics. Like I think it means anarchy, not not minarchy, and it means no IP, not IP, and uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, I don't think you need to be a Randian, really. I think I think basically for libertarians, it's important to be uh, rational and to be a realist. That is, believe in reality and in our, and the efficacy of reason, um, and uh, and to believe in the libertarian principles, right? The basic non-aggression principle. Um, let me get your thoughts about some other um, more contemporary, popular thinkers or at least podcasters so what, what what are your thoughts on jordan peterson <laughs> if any i almost want have you read have you read uh the fountainhead by ayn rand i did a long time ago there's a line in there this is a little bit too too snark, it's too snarky but um there's a line where the the main character howard Rourke, who's under siege from all these collectivists in society he meets up with his arch enemy ellsworth Tuhi, who's this evil newspaper editor and he meets Rourke on a bridge and he says tell me Mr. Rourke what do you think of me no one's here listening tell me what you think of me and Rourke says but I don't think of you <laughs> I mean I'm not that interested in Peterson to be honest uh, 
I do like that he stood up to this ridiculous uh, transgender crap in Canada a few years ago. He's a smart guy. He doesn't think like I do. He's all over the all over the map with his metaphors and his meandering explanations. I guess it's good he wrote a self help guide saying things that are, should be obvious to anyone who's grown up in the world and who has a bit of sense, like make your bed, that kind of stuff. Um, from Thaddeus Russell, who I I like in many ways um, and I like personally, um, I think he's very critical of Jordan's knowledge of postmodernism, which I don't know a lot about, but but Russell's critique seems to be solid, so I don't know if I agree with all that. All this stuff about the Old Testament and you know having 17 hours of lectures on one sentence in the Old Testament, I could care less about that kind of crap. I can't stand all this kind of navel-gazing, metaphorical, hyper-religious-friendly – I just – it's useless to me. Um, I like his daughter a lot, actually, and I like some of her interviews. I like some of Jordan's interviews. I like the guy personally. I think it's good he shifted slowly towards the liberal, libertarian-ish direction. He's just not – I just don't think he's a systematic, coherent, very rigorous thinker overall, but I would take him in a second over the left. Yeah, yeah. I mean I have a lot of thoughts thoughts about him, um, and you know, he's an astounding intellect or whatever, so who am I to – to to, yeah. to to criticize him, but um, you know the the fact that he doesn't argue from first principles um, politically um, makes it a little bit difficult because now he's in a very abstract world of symbols and what the archetypes exactly. Mean. Well, it's uh, not just that. So, and the, and the arguments aren't rigorous because so like you if you are talking all these symbols and metaphors all the time. You can never really establish anything solid, and you can't really criticize it either because it's just a way of looking at things. You know, it's like you know. Uh, but I find it interesting. But it's all again. It's almost like reading Omni magazine or something. You know, <laughs> talking. But I, I'm um, being too critical of him. But I'm just I put it this way. I think he's good for lots of people. I just don't. That's not where my interests lie in following that stuff in, in detail. Just like the neo reactionary crap. I just my eyes glaze over at all this neo reactionary stuff. All this kind of vaguely anti Semitic white power. You know, uh, um, paganist. I, all this stuff just makes my eyes. Wait, who are these? It. Who are these people? I can't even. And they would say I'm, I'm lumping people together: the neo, the neo reactionaries, uh, the the alt right types, the the guys that believe in the uh, like oh. Richard Spencer. Richard Spencer was the pa- you know he was a pagan and the white he's, right. the, he's the you know the white race crap and then the neo reactionary guys the, and the Minchus Molebug types. The guys who kind of left liberty – they believe in might makes right to an extent. There's all this kind of vaguely like – vaguely anti-Semitic, vaguely anti-black. Not not all of them, but um, uh, vaguely vaguely Nietzschean, you know, um, uh, might power. makes right. Uh, yeah. They talk – they usually all these code words like high trust society and um, ghetto ethics and um, – um, they use the word cuck a lot. I mean, it just turns me off all this stuff, you know. <laughs> I could I could care yeah. less. To yeah, me, yeah. it all to me it's all just a complicated, jumbled way of saying I favor aggression in these cases for this reason. Okay. So you're a criminal or you're a statist. Fine. Because I'm a libertarian. I'm gonna be a libertarian no matter what mumbo jumbo you spout at me. Okay. All I see is someone who says, I believe that your rights should be invaded. Because of this reason, which is just what a criminal says and just what a dictator says, they always have a reason for being willing to violate your rights. You know, to me, it's, it's, just, funny. it's just it's just window dressing. That's great. Um, to me, I'm almost more willing to forgive a standard Democrat Republican for their contradictory beliefs um, because they don't they don't have any principles on which they rest. But Correct. Um, you you talk to a minarchist or something, and they they will claim to have principles and then vociferously. Um, uh, not apply those principles that they claim they have um, consistently or whatever. So it's almost l- less forgivable for a person really close to to the thing, but not at the thing. I agree, and I, I I've noticed now I've noticed a shift. Like say 10, 15 years ago, like I would sometimes sometimes half jokingly, but not quite. I'll call a minarchist. I'll say you're a mini, so you're a mini statist. They get, they get so upset. Oh, statism means this, so they get pedantic. You know, they get about so. Yeah, but okay. The definition of statist doesn't mean someone who believes in a minimal state. But 
you do believe in a minimal state, you're a mini statist. I mean, and I'm trying to highlight that they're they're favoring something that they oppose in another realm of their libertarian life. Um, I almost, <coughs> but I've noticed that like nowadays, if, if you if you criticize minarchists as just being totally incoherent and principled libertarians, you don't get the pushback you used to get. You know, everyone sort of knows we're on the. I think we anarchists are on the rise with our moral fervor and our certainty and our and the coherence of our arguments. Um, I think minarchists, they criticize anarchists for being utopians, but they're the utopians because they believe in having a monopoly of agents with a monopoly on violence using it properly. Everything we know about human nature, game theory, and monopolies shows you that what's going to happen is what has happened, and there has there have been thousands of governments in the world, and there's a couple hundred right now. <clears throat> There's never ever in history been a minimal state. That's why they lie and they portray the founding fathers generation, the original American system. They portray it as being almost perfect, which is complete bullshit. Um, I mean, women. You know, if you say women and slaves didn't have rights, they call you some kind of lefty PC type. But it's fucking true, you know. Uh, what what the fuck? And, and not only that, even the poor whites didn't. I mean, you know, this was the, the revolution was done for the benefit of the white, rich white male aristocratic landholders, who basically stepped into the shoes of the king of Eng of, of of the of the of the British king's place. They stepped into their place, so they just stepped into the place of power, interest increased their land holdings, right? Got their debts paid off because of inflation and all this kind of crap. Um, and, and they basically set in motion a centralizing government, which we have now, the biggest government in world history. They achieved what they wanted to do. You know, It was a coup. It was a centralizing coup. I don't know how uh, – so, so the point is there has never been a minarchy in the history of the world, and the American founding generation was, was no – nothing near libertarian. There were a few statements they made in their, in their propaganda to get people to accept it that sounded vaguely libertarian, You know, the declaration, some of the – you know, calling the calling the Constitution the protection of the people's rights, successfully selling that that bullshit to everyone uh, to get them to vote in favor of it. But the Constitution was to constitute or to make up a new government, and it was a threat to rights. And because people were afraid of the threat, they said, "We're going to put some limits on what it can do, so that this new thing we're creating doesn't become a threat to your rights." So to call that whole endeavor an attempt to protect rights is ridiculous. It's like saying we're going to give a machine gun to an idiot, but we're going to put a safety on the machine gun to protect your rights. You know. Anyway, that's great. So, no, uh, I think minarchists are. I feel like I'm being generous when I include them in the umbrella term libertarian. So they should they should be grateful. You know, I, I know probably a lot of us, maybe you included, uh, were on that part of the fence. Um, and all we needed was a little bit of rational debate to get there. So obviously, I think a little bit of patience and forgiveness is is acceptable. But absolutely, if someone, if, absolutely. If someone sp spends a decade um, arguing against it, then um, it, they're they're almost more contem contemptible in my eyes. I, I, um, I totally agree. I mean, there's a joke that's uh, what's the difference between a minarchist and anarchist, and the answer is about six months. Now, it took me about uh, it took me about eight, six years, but that was because that was 1982. I was a high school student, and then in, in law school in 88, finally I, you know, I was trapped in objectivism for so long. Finally, when I read the Fried, uh, David Friedman, The Market for Liberty, and the Tannehill – I'm sorry, The Market for Liberty by the Tannehills and David Friedman, Machinery of Freedom, and Rothbard's stuff on anarchy, and Robert Nozick even, even though he's not an anarchist. When I read that stuff, I finally was willing to go all the way. But nowadays, there's le there's much less of an excuse because there are so many of us that are anarchists, and the arguments are so loud and persuasive, and you know that it's libertarian. Um, I don't think there's much of an excuse to be a minarchist for very long anymore. Right before the internet, um, I would have exactly. to go to B Barnes and Noble, and I would have to buy you know Mary Ruart's book or Rupert's book. Um, Mary Ruart, uh, Heal healing, Ruart. healing the world, healing, healing the world. The world. Yeah, that was that was probably the first one that really changed my mind. And most people say Ayn Rand. And to, to me, I got through um, Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged and stuff. And to me, I would just prefer her 
um, nonfiction articles and, and argumentation. Like I don't yeah. need a, a story to embed something. Maybe some people do. Oh yeah, um, some people some people definitely do, or they did. And by the way, I would say that in my the Fountainhead is the first book I read that started changing me. But in retrospect, I don't really know why because the Fountainhead I think is a horrible. Um, it's not libertarian at all. Atlas Shrugged is another matter. Atlas Shrugged is magnificent and great. Uh, a few deviations on IP and stuff, but it's great. It's, it's even quasi-anarchist. Um, but The Fountainhead is about a guy that is a, a weird narcissist. He's, he's almost – I won't say a sociopath, but he's, he's, um, he's got some issues. He, he, he hates his clients. He won't do what his clients want. Uh, he's a loner. Um, he's a quasi rapist. He's got some weird sexual things, and then he becomes an intellectual property terrorist by dynamiting someone else's property because he, they violated his intellectual property rights. So I'm I'm still mystified as to why that made me libertarian. I just think there's a, the one aspect of it is it teaches you the virtue of independence and like following your views no matter what society says, and that maybe can inspire a young a young high school student like me. Uh, living among people who are, are not – don't share similar things, but I don't think it's libertarian at all. Atlas Shrugged is one of the founding libertarian works, but it is fiction, and some people don't need that or like that. And, but some people really are inspired by that kind of stuff, I think. Interesting, right. Yeah, but I, I, mean, never, I never read I never read Ruart's book. Uh, that was kind of after my immer- exposure to libertarianism, and I've never read it. I've talked to her. I've read a couple excerpts. Um, I think I want her to to make it more anti IP in the next version, but uh, <laughs> but I had I know that book has influenced some people. Yeah, my my original copy was um, all warped because I would read it in the bathtub. Um, I would, would read it. Inter- it. Oh, okay, sorry. Go ahead. Keep going. I, I I would read it in the bathtub, so my copy is like all warped and yellow and stuff like that. And then the the internet happened. And I could go to Lou Rockwell. I could go to Str- Strike the Root. Did you ever write for Strike the Root? Uh, I've published on there. I had long debates on there with that guy, John Kennedy. and these other, I don't remember if I had an article in there, but I used to say things provocative just to piss them off. And they would just – like one time I had this thing. It's funny. You can look it up. Uh, when I was writing on Lou Rockwell, I, I wrote something like – it was kind of tongue-in-cheek, but I said something like – if we have to have driver's licenses, you should have a license. You have to, you should have to have a license to breed. And and I, my point was that it was really an ethical thing. Like you shouldn't have children unless you're emotionally and financially able to take care of them. And I really still believe that. I think it's immoral and irresponsible for all these people to run around having kids when they when they can't afford it, and then they need to get on welfare. They need support. You know. Have kids, and they complain about the cost of tuition. It's like, yeah, well, you had seven kids, and you can't afford it. You sh- should have only had one or two, whatever. So I said maybe we should have a license to breed. Now, I kind of said that knowing it was going to set these guys off, and they went crazy. They said, oh, Kinsella thinks you should have a license to breed. He's not a libertarian. Of course, I was kind of joking. right? I don't really think the government should require it, but what I meant was that you could even argue that there's a positive obligation on the part of parents – to take care of the children, which I do believe, even a legally enforceable one, although that's not feasible in most cases. But I think technically you violate your kids' rights when you don't care for them properly, when you have when you have the ability to do so, and you should. Um, so that means if you bring a child into the world when you're not ready to, like you marry the wrong woman, don't have a kid with her. You know, choose choose your mate carefully. Have a kid when you're ready. Plan these things out. Be a responsible grown-up adult. And if you don't do that, I think you can make a case that you're kind of infringing the kids rights or at least you're being a bad parent that was only my point you know that um so th- there was that debate on there there's others um why do you ask about strike the root uh i would just talk about my early days and how difficult it was to find these ideas i didn't you know i didn't know where to go um but lou rockwell existed strike the root existed uh there were very few places on the internet where i could find this information then of course mises institute started putting everything online and i think that's where i first read your stuff um what does it feel like to have been there at the early days and to have known rothbard uh and still know hapa and to have contributed significantly to um the foundation uh, especially with the ip stuff like that must feel amazing yeah it's odd um i think i'm slow on the uptake sometimes to reflect and realize things because i'm 55 now 
and just now I still feel like I'm 25 years old sometimes like being naive and because I, I I'm just realizing some things now like uh, I didn't plan out my sort of my, my my legal career or my family career exactly or my intellectual sort of avocation but it's worked out great because I just dedicated myself to it and I think I was lucky in some ways um, so it feels great I enjoy my position and I enjoy being part of it. I, I've always, I've always wanted to. I think this is what I aspired to when I was younger. Uh, like even in high school, I kind of, I was in uh, rural Louisiana. I was bookish. I liked philosophy and ideas and all this stuff. And I just liked intellectualism. And I didn't know what I was missing. I mean, I, I, I if I had known then what I know now about, say, New York and these areas, I would have, I would have been miserable knowing I wasn't part of all that. And I probably would have aspired to do that in college. Like I just went to LSU because it was a school down the road, but, <clears throat> and I went to engineering, right, which I never practiced. So I probably sh would have done something different, but I just kept applying myself to it. I've just really enjoyed it because I, I, and being a lawyer actually from Louisiana has helped me coincidentally because the Roman law stuff I learned contributed greatly to my unique ability, I think, to analyze the law. And I've just realized that just in the last few years, like, I've become more confident in what I say because I've realized I'm not – when you're operating without a net and you're, you're kind of conservative like I am, conservative and – that means tentative in, 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 in advancing things you're not certain of. And you, I always want to kick the tires and make sure I've read all the possible literature I can to make sure I'm not missing something someone else discovered. I'm always incremental in what I do, so that, that's why I think my stuff has been good is because it's incremental and it grows in an organic fashion, but it's part of a systematic – nature because I, i'm careful about putting the next block into it um so in law school you know i, re I read as much as i could and I, I used to think everyone had read everything i'd read so over the years when i would run into someone said well yeah there's a law review article in 1974 on this i thought everyone had read all this i thought everyone was doing what i had done but now i realize i'm i'm kind of unique or I, i'm uh, i'm 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 um in the minority on this kind of stuff so now I'm more confident in saying things even when I'm operating without a net because I know there's no one else who knows more because I know so I know what everything's out, I know all the stuff that's out there and I'm just confident no one I would have found it if someone had done this already and solved all these things um, unless it's some you know PhD dissertation hidden in a basement somewhere which I have stumbled across but I think you would have heard about these things um, so I met Rothbard in 94 one time right before he died like two months before he died and that was great. We um, we had a great conversation. Uh, in retrospect, I see now what happened was, you know, I I, I wrote a, I wrote a long essay about Hoppe's thing. I was starting to get into my rights theory in law school, and then after law school, I, I published it in a law review. I sent it to Hans, and so Hoppe and Rothbard and and these guys were excited, you know, because at the time the movement was still pretty small. So they found a bright young lawyer rising through the ranks. Who was a potential another voice, was kind of on their side, adding to theory. So I went to the, this John Randolph Society meeting they had in Crystal City, Virginia, in November of '94, and I was living in Philly at the time. <clears throat> and I went there to meet Hoppe, really, but and I met Rothbard, Lou Rockwell, David Gordon, Walter, these guys in person. And I, I met Rothbard. We, Rothbard and I spent about 30 minutes alone in an auditorium before a, for a talk, and we talk, chatted, chatted, chatted. And of course, I wish I had known he was about to die because I would have done more. But I think he was interested in my argument, my 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 estoppel argument, which is like my argument for rights, which is similar to Hoppe's argumentation ethics, which I had sent Hoppe the article about. Because I'm pretty sure Rothbard had read it by then and was mildly favorable because he had already endorsed Hoppe's argumentation ethics, and he must have been aware of my complementary argument. So I think he would have welcomed it with open arms. Which leads me to believe that if he had just lived another couple of years, because I was about to publish my first anti-IP stuff like in 1994, 95, um, I, I am confident Rothbard would have said, oh, yeah, I, I, I slightly went off, off the rails on copyright in Ethics of Liberty. Kinsella's right. I think he would have totally joined us on that one. Um, not because I'm trying to put words in his mouth or – bend him to my service, but I, re for, I really know this stuff really, really well. I've read his stuff in detail. I'm certain he would have because, number one, his entire contract theory, the core of his property theory, and his comments on defamation law are all incompatible with what he said about 
copyright by contract. And what he said about copyright by contract is just confusing based upon the history of copyright law and, um, and, uh, and the way IP law works. I think he just didn't know a lot about it, so he made some missteps there. Uh, and furthermore, he was on a panel with Rothbard in 19 – I mean, so with Hoppe in 1988 uh, when Hoppe was asked an IP question, and Hans immediately said that you can't own ideas because they're – they're not they're not a means of action. They're they're knowledge that guides action. So Hans got it right right away by applying praxeology, the praxeological framework very carefully. Um, and Rothbard sat there and didn't object. And I think he would I, I, so I don't think he disagreed. I just don't think he took it anywhere. I think if you would have said, now Rothbard, you disagreed with Hans on this. Do you understand that that means what you said about copyright and ethics of liberty is a little bit wrong? He probably would have said, yeah, yeah, I need to revisit that. He just didn't have time to get around to it. That's my guess about that. But so then, because Rothbard died January of the next year, Hans became the chief, edit, the only editor of the JLS, the Journal of Libertarian Studies, and the co editor of the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. So Hans became the editor of the JLS for 10 years. And he called me because I was a new intellectual in his life, and he said, Kinsella, would you be the book review editor? I said, OK. So I started doing that. I started going to Mises conferences and presenting my papers at their Austrian Scholars Conference, just 15-minute, 20, 25-minute presentations of a paper. And almost all of those turned into articles, which I think are kind of my some of my significant contributions like causation theory, contract theory, intellectual property theory, legislation and law, that kind of stuff. Um, so gradually over time, it just became my intellectual home, and I just felt natural to me at the time. I never sought attention. I was always humble. I still am humble. Um, over the years, I, I realized I only have gone to places when I got invited to uh, after that initial set of stuff. So why did you go to Arizona for that thing? Because someone invited me to speak. Why did you go to Brazil? Someone invited me to speak. I just go where people invite me. It's just like my podcast. My podcast is just where people invite me to go on their show, and I put it on my feed. Um, but in the last couple of years, I've enjoyed – so every time I go to a conference, I've been invited to speak, and it's always stressful to me, although less so in recent years. I've gotten more comfortable speaking. I used to be nervous. Now I'm not nervous because I know my field so well, and I'm just more comfortable speaking now. But just practice, I guess. Uh, but um, – it's always uncomfortable to go to a talk, a conference, because I'm always stressed out before I speak, and I'm always preparing to the last minute. And as soon as I give my talk, then I can enjoy the conference. So la the last couple of years, I'll sometimes go to a conference just as an attendee, like most people do. And I enjoy that so much because I just go there with a sigh of relief, and I just get to enjoy myself. I don't have to speak. I don't have to prepare. So it's kind of a mixture now. And my, my son is just going off to college this summer, so I'm finally going to be an empty nester. Which I'd never even thought about before, and I'm going to miss him. But now I'll have the, and I'm 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 basically mostly retired. I only work about three or four hours a week, um, so I have all this time and freedom to do whatever I want. My wife is cool with it, so I'm going to start traveling to more and more conferences just because I enjoy it. I enjoy hanging out, Bitcoin conferences and Libertarian conference. I just went to Porkfest, you know. I went to a Bitcoin thing in in Austin. I went to the Bitcoin thing in Miami. Uh, I'm going to go to Hoppus thing in September. I'm going on uh, next month. I'm going to Alaska on a bike riding trip, an e-bike with three 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 libertarian friends uh, with trek travel. So I've been enjoying the hell out of it. Uh, and I got off on a tangent, but that's I enjoy being part. Of, I enjoy discussing libertarian theory. And you know, when I go to when I go to events, you know, I've I guess I've become a libertarian, and I never intended to. Although I kind of resent the term celebritarian because in the beginning that term I've never heard to, that. Celebritarian is a term that they you know I think it's more for people that became famous for being famous, you know, like little YouTube personalities or something. Uh, but then there's a group of us who are known because of our libertarian theory contributions or our place in prominent institutions like you know Lou Rockwell, the founder of the of Mises Institute, people like that. Um, um, so I'm I I'm I am what's Robert Bork's word? I am um, um I forgot the word he uses for um uh, I'm pleased that people can talk with me 
about or recognize some of the or have read some of the stuff I've done and we can talk about it. But I don't really I consider myself to be standing on the shoulders of giants and part of an incremental development of ideas. And everyone is part of this. Everyone is seeking truth. Someone so, someone will walk up to me at a conference. And they'll say, oh, thank you for writing that book. And I'll say, well, thank you for reading it, because that means we're all trying to think about ideas in service of liberty and truth. And I just love being part of it. And I love that there's more people you can talk about now. Uh, I, I love it all. I've enjoyed the hell of it. And now I'm realizing as you know, a lot of people when they get to retirement age, I mean, I'm only 55, but um, I'm, I'm get, getting into those years. Uh, a lot of people when they retire, they, they're left with a vacuum. They don't know what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Their kids are gone. Um, they, they've been spending their life on their careers and they don't have any hobbies, any outside interests. I've always had this avocation on top of my vocation. And that's my, I have seven, seven or eight books I want to write and I'm working on. I can work on that forever. And I can keep staying involved in things like this. So I'm not worried about retirement. For me, retirement is just going to give me more liberty to do things like this. Um, so I guess it's, it's sort of inadvertently led me to a perch I can land on and rely on in my, in my, you know, in my last 30, 30, hopefully 30 years. So I, I've enjoyed being part of it, um, if that answers your question. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, yeah, to... to what greater um, pursuit than the pursuit of the deepest questions about uh, society and and rights and right and wrong, and so that's the that's better than probably fishing, maybe a little bit better I mean, than going fishing. I, I've never been one of these sort of what I view as an insecure type who always has to try to elevate their way of doing life, and to, because they feel a little bit insecure about it, they criticize the way everyone else does it. I don't believe that at all. I mean. There's a million ways to live life. Um, this is what gives me – oh, gratification. That's the word I'm looking for. Robert Bork used that word in his sort of consequentialist view of things. Like uh, people have gratifications, so we need to maximize gratifications. I would say I was gratified by that. But um, this is one reason I've never been much of an activist, and I've been skeptical of that. And also I've always been immune to or not impressed by people that say, oh, Kinsella – the way you just presented that was too rude or too harsh, or that's not a way to sell your ideas to people. And I'm like, I'm not trying to sell my ideas to people. I'm trying to advance libertarian thought, primarily for me. To me, it's like a big puzzle. I want to figure it out. I want to figure out as much. That's why, that's why I think I've made progress because I have a sincere personal ambition and drive to solve this, this gap, this lacuna, this confusion I saw in libertarian thought, like on intellectual property or like on causation theory or like on contract theory. I figure, fuck, it's a big gap there. It's, it's a low-hanging fruit. I think I'm equipped to possibly do it. I'm going to do it just because I like contributing to thought. So when people say, oh, well, your ideas aren't making much progress, I'm like, they're making progress for me and the people that read it. So I'm almost – I'm almost a. a and the hair of Albert J. Knox's view of the remnant, which is that, look, we're not going to change the world by passing out pamphlets to our uncles at Thanksgiving dinner. Um, we're going to keep the ideas of liberty alive in the remnant so that when society finally achieves an advanced state, because I think we're still in a primitive state, uh, even though we have space shuttles and lasers, we're still, we're still just kind of primitive monkeys, tribal monkeys superstitious tribal monkeys. Um, when we finally reach an advanced state, the ideas of liberty will be there for people to draw on, sort of like we, rede we rediscovered Justinian's code of Roman law after, after 800 years or whatever. It was lost, and we rediscovered it, or Aristotle's works. Um, it'll be there uh, to help develop things, but I don't think that libertarian ideas are the cause of liberty. I think liberty has to emerge naturally. But I just enjoy advancing libertarian theory because I'm contributing to something that I think is important, and I don't think my role is that momentous. I think it's – I think it has been significant to a certain degree because I've been lucky to have been born where it was advanced enough to have a solid foundation but, but primitive enough to have work left to do, and I've identified low-hanging fruit, and I've worked to – I've worked to develop my – knowledge and skill set so that I could contribute in a meaningful way to some things without being a total crank. So that's all I do, and I enjoy it. And But I think everyone plays a role in their own way, even if you're just a quiet listener, you know, and then you, you live your life in a good way because of that, or you deepen your understanding. Everyone plays their role, and I love that about our movement. Cool. Um, I've almost taken two hours of your time, 
and uh, you've been unbelievably generous in answering these questions. Um, could I, I ask got, if- uh, Yeah, I got 15 more minutes if you want. 15, all right, all right let's do it. Um, here's some stuff that's not necessarily philosophical, but just to get to know you, the guy. Uh, so do you fall down any rabbit holes in YouTube? Um, I mean, they could be intellectual rabbit holes yeah. or just yeah. wasting wasting your time. Yeah, I watch like Wealth by Slayman, you know, some of these uh, couples prank videos a lot. Prank videos. Uh, well, you, I, you, I, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, what, what were you say? Well, you, you had uh, published a video where you asked your wife if you're going 80 miles an hour, how far do you go in an hour? Or something yeah. like that. I, no, that's not really. That wasn't really a prank. That was one of those memes that was going around. And my wife's an engineer. We're both engineers. And I asked her. She was like, God, "How can you be asking me such a stupid question?" Good. Um, I was, you, I, was, I was just listening to something on YouTube. Uh, oh no, it was it was. A, I've been reading Blinkist a lot. Tom Woods recommended it. I've 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 probably read sixty books on Blinkist now, or I, I've listened to audio versions of the book summaries of about sixty books. And one of them was the one by Daniel Kahneman. I just read it yesterday. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow, something like that. Because I'm in, I'm I'm interested in psychology lately. Ever since I've recently learned a lot about alcohol, last year I quit drinking eight months ago. Oh wow! Um, and it's been amazing, and uh, my life is so much better. I've I've learned so much about it in, in coming in that process, uh, and I've learned about psychology and doing it. So I'm interested in psychology, but he had this brain. He's there was an there's an example between the intuitive process, the instinctual process, the fast thinking, and the slow thinking, the rational process. And so there's I'll, I'll give it to you. See what you think. You have a uh, – I forgot what the items were. Like there's a, a, a candy bar and a marble or something like that, and you buy them, and they, totally they cost $1.10. But one of them is $0.10 cents more than the other. So what are the relative prices? Like what's your instinct to say? One of them is $0.10 cents more than the other? Yeah, so it's a dollar ten total. Mm -hmm. One's ten cents more than the other. So what did each item cost? Uh, maybe one is fifty-five cents. 60 okay, so you're cents. thinking right. You're thinking rationally. So, the, the, so the answer is the instinct. Your instinctual answer would be, oh, one's a dollar, one's ten cents, right? That's your instinct. That's your fast thinking brain. But that's wrong. It seems like that. So you're you're fast. And the slow thing, if you think about it, it's it's a dollar. It's a dollar five and ninety. It's a dollar five and five cents. Wow, I got it. Oh my god. And you can get. It's easy to think. It's easy to understand if you think about it rationally. But the point is that your brain tries the, the most efficient way first, which is your instinct. Uh, another question in that realm. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But um, is the Monty Hall problem? Which yeah, 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 yeah. I have an explanation for that doesn't rely on fractions and math. Um, and I've brought it to really rational people, like a lawyer, for example, who literally doesn't agree with the true you, you answer. Mean, you mean the probability thing about opening the doors and the goat and all that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah. There, you're on a game show. You have three doors. Uh, behind two doors is a goat. Behind one is a whole bunch of money. Um, yeah. You choose a door. Um, and the host says, all right, before you open this door, you have the chance to um, open. An, what? I will open one of the other doors. And he'll reveal a goat on the other door. Do you stay? Do you switch doors or does it not matter? Correct. Right. Yeah, and I, I actually I actually have the original Marilyn Vos Savant column on that. When it came out, she posed a question. I remember I was reading, this is like 20 years ago, and uh, I got the answer right. And then all the, then, she get, then she gave the right answer and all the readers went apeshit and they all sent these letters in saying how she was wrong. And but finally, she persuaded most of them. No, nope, it's it's counterintuitive, but you're wrong. And I, I think I'll, I'm curious what your take on it is. But most of the contrarian answers on that, they involve uh, changing. They involve going outside the question and changing the nature of the question, like like changing the premises of the question. Like, well, in a real world, if this is really happening, maybe she's doing this or something like that. But if you take it for what the most reasonable statement of the problem is, the answer is you should switch, right? You have a two-thirds right. chance that you have two-thirds chance of getting the car if you switch. And uh, I think a lot of people forget the hidden assumption, which is the host is obviously not going to reveal the money one. Um, he's got to keep the game going. So he's of the two remaining one. He's going to obviously show you the goat, not the money. Um, so that's a sort of hidden variable there. But if you were to extend the analogy to a hundred doors, and you you stood in front of one, and then 
he opened 98 of the remaining 99 to reveal goat, 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 then it's a little bit more obvious. Correct. Then you can't just assume your original assumptions or what you assume because I just think that means the problem is more ambiguous then. You're not stating all the exact presuppositions that you need to know to answer the question. I, I agree with you. But I think um, the way it's originally stated, is there's a reasonable interpretation of the question. Right. Um, so I asked about rabbit holes that you fell down. Anything else you want to mention on YouTube that you waste, you maybe feel like you waste your time on? Um, um, well, I watch a lot of television. I watch a lot of prestige TV, like Lucifer, you know, Handmaid's Tale, that kind of stuff. Um, I, I like romantic comedies. I remember I asked Hans, when like Hans Hoppe, when I asked him, what kind of stuff do you like? He likes romantic comedies too. Hans is a sap. <laughs> <laughs> he's sort of a, not sap what's the right word for uh he's a, softie, a romantic he's a, a softy yeah you know, stuff and i like i like little romantic comedies um so i like romantic com i like rom-coms i cry I, I cry easily in movies and things like that uh if you're gonna get personal uh on the internet um i read drudge report I read Slate. I read a lot of things all my conservative and Trumpy friend, they freak out about, you know, like, oh, I can't believe you watch CNN. I can't believe you read the New York Times. I can't believe you listen to Slate. I listen to a lot of Slate podcasts. Slate podcasts like uh, the Political Gap Fest and the Culture Gap Fest. I know they're left leaning, but, you know, I enjoy their take anyway. <coughs> um, and at least I can tell their leftism when it rears its head and I can just discount it. Um, tons of podcasts. I have so many, I can't get through them all anymore. Tom Woods. I think my number one podcast would be Tom Woods, uh, Bob Murphy, some libertarian podcasts, a lot of Bitcoin podcasts, um, some culture podcasts, some alcohol podcasts. Um, lots increasing. I, I'm always been frustrated with YouTube channels because I like podcasts better, but all this, all the, all the, what do you, the, let's say the beat generation, what do you call the modern generation? Millennials, post-millennials, Gen X. They all like they all like YouTube instead of podcasts now, which drives me crazy. Uh, um, so YouTube channels, uh, the, the prank videos. Um, oh, I like the scammer, like Kit Boga, where he scams these Indian scammers. scammers. Yeah. I like those. I, those are fun. <laughs> it, it's just a wonderful sense of um, uh, c civilian justice. And I watch a lot of these five minute things from like Dave Dan, uh, Shapiro, Ben Shapiro, like debunking the, the the left. Although it gets a little bit tedious over time. I'm kind of getting sick of Fox News because they have the same old. Can you believe this woman would not kneel for the flag? The, the the rage porn on the GOP Republican side. My mother is addicted to it, and she visits my house on occasion and. We don't have cable news or anything, and I have to yeah. set up a computer so she can watch Fox News so that she can get her injection of rage, yeah. and I, it's exhausting. Uh, yeah, I can't I had, walk. Yeah. I had my, my – my, I love – my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law love, love dearly. They're both hyper-conservative, libertarian leanings. They live with us for several months over Christmas, and, um, and every time I would have CNN on, they would freak out. You know, they got to have Fox on. Yeah, yeah, but then, but then, my son and their daughters are all like modern. They're all cool kids. My son is libertarian leaning, but he's a he's a modern woke kid. They're all woke, you know. They're all totally, uh, what do you call it? They're totally inclusive, and you know, they, they're not racist. You know, they don't care about all the crap. And they're like, they're they're a little bit disgusted with Fox News, and I can kind of understand it. I'm seeing it through their eyes now. You know, like they walk in the house, you got Fox News on all the time. It's the same old crap over and over again. Um, and my dad recently, my dad, I, I hooked him up with YouTube TV and he can't find a weather channel and he's, he's begging me to hook him up with the weather channel. I'm like, why? He just wants to sit and watch the weather all the time. This is what old people do, I guess. I'm like, just open up an app and you'll see what the weather is. He, he wants to watch these live reports all the time. I guess that's better yeah. than Fox News. It, it's maybe like their version of meditation app. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, they're, wor they're always worried about the weather for some reason. Worried about that. Worried about the weather, um, but without the hate. Um, okay. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I've only got a couple minutes with you. Go ahead. So, go ahead. Go ahead. I got some time. A, any musical? So let's say guilty pleasures. Now a lot of people respond to the question of guilty pleasures. Say I don't feel guilty about anything. No. What I mean by guilty pleasures is things that you think other people would not understand or respect, or maybe mm -hmm. look down down upon you for listening to. I don't know. I mean, I. I, I don't know if I'm alone in this. I think a lot of people get stuck in their musical taste in a certain era, like 
um, I've liked some bands since my the heyday of when I got interested in music, but I'm stuck in that era where I learned to love it. And so I, there's some bands I listen to over and over and over again for like 30, 40 years. So Rush is my – Rush used to be my all-time favorite band, but slowly over time, Pink Floyd has overtaken it. So Pink Floyd is by far my favorite band in the world, and I listen to them repeatedly over and over and over and over, and over again. Uh, but I love The Cult. I love Iron Maiden. I love uh, Triumph, Saxon, and Riot. And Ingwie Malmsteen, those are like my favorites. And, and then some others that are a little bit softer, like Boston and Journey and those guys. But I also love like Madonna and Gwen Stefani and this kind of stuff. Um, I just love I love that kind of fun stuff, you know, the catchy stuff, heart. Um, but lately, some classical. I've been listening to space music and some of that chill music that Amy, my friend Juan Carpio in Ecuador, he's into ayahuasca. He got me into that ayahuasca music. I think it's called Spongle. I said, Spongle. listen to that. I, I know like Spongle. Um, so I don't know if it's indefensible, but uh, I like I like candy ass music sometimes, catchy stuff, syrupy stuff. But I really like the good '80s hard rock. Do, do you play uh, guitar or something like that? No, I wish I'd learned. I started learning piano briefly with when I got my son Suzuki lessons. The teacher made me take lessons for three months, and I thought about learning piano in my. Um, in my retirement years, but I have just too many other interests. So I never did learn an instrument. Um, uh, last couple, last couple songs about music. Is there a song that you have a negative association with? It's not that you hate it. It's that um, just, you don't like it because of where you were at the time. Not really. I don't really think like that. Uh, a lot of times my son or will ask me a question like, what's your favorite color? And I'll say, I don't think like that. Right. <laughs> Partly because I'm a hyper Austrian subject. I don't yep. think it – what does it mean to have your favorite color? Uh, it's like – when people say that, I think they're almost retarded because it's like – so let's say blue is your favorite color. What does that mean? You want everything in the world to be blue? No. <laughs> what, so what does it even mean? It's like a meaningless statement, I think. Uh, sometimes I want to wear a blue shirt. Do you ever wear a white shirt? Yeah. So so how can you demonstrate your preference for blue? So uh, I can think of one song that – I would say triggers me because it was uh, I got to be delicate here. It was a song that uh, evokes memories of uh, a past part of my life where um, things that happened were painful about it later. Got and, it. Uh, like a ro romantic kind of thing. So yeah, got there's it. a song I don't really want to hear because it would bring back painful memories. Maybe. Do, do you want to mention it or uh, not? Uh, it's by <laughs> it's by the group Century. And the, the album is And Soul It Goes, A-N-S-O-U-L, It Goes. Um, it's kind of obscure. It's a European band. I can't remember which song it is on there. I know it when I hear it, though. All right. I will look it up. Um, let's see here. Um, your first um, – no, let's go, let's go here. Do you have any dreams, recurring dreams, where you're like, yes. why, why am I having yeah. a recurring dream? Yeah. Well, lately – it hasn't happened lately, but um, like I said, I stopped drinking alcohol eight months ago. Actually, eight months today. It was November 4th because I remember I, dr I got drunk on Election Day, November 3rd. <laughs> it's the last time I've ever drank. And I think it's the last time I ever will from what I've learned about alcohol. Um, so I, I, I wanted to stop drinking because I was drinking too – well, I say I was drinking too much, but it was harmful, harmful to my health and other things. And so I struggled trying – I struggled to quit because when you drink, it's hard to quit. For a lot of people, and that's because they're addicted. Because alcohol is addictive. Um, I don't think the word alcoholic is coherent, but I think alcohol is an addictive drug. So when you try to quit, it's hard to quit. Um, and you have to to realize why it takes a, an intellectual journey. And I, I finally did that. Um, it's that's why I got into psychology. It's, it's because your subconscious has been brainwashed into false beliefs about it being good, which is why your subconscious craves it, even though your rational mind knows you should. When people try to quit, their rational mind is saying, this is bad. I want to quit or I want to slow down, and they can't, and they don't know why they can't. And they, The reason they can't is their subconscious mind is at war with their rational mind. You have, you have like a, a dissonance, and the only way to stop really without white-knuckling it and doing willpower is to erase the false beliefs in your subconscious, and there's a process you can go through to do that. It's called liminal, liminal steps, but um, um, so 
you have drinking dreams when you quit drinking. You have these dreams where like you think you, you wake up and you're like, fuck, I just had a drink and I didn't want to. And then you wake up and you realize those go away over time. But ever since I was in college, I still have these dreams where I show up to class, I miss a class, yeah. or I show up, I show up unprepared, or I, I, I slept through the test. I still have those dreams that I wake up in a panic. Or I'm at, or the other one is this recurring for me. I used to work at a law firm. So when I got out of law school, I worked for big law firms for 10 years. Um, and that's and then I worked as a general counsel for a high-tech company for 10 years. And then for the last 10 or 12 years, I've been a solo lawyer. I do patent law for private clients. So I've had three sorts of phases of my career, big law firms, general counsel, and now solo. Um, <clears throat> and the big law firm thing, I loved it. I learned a lot. But it's kind of, I won't say brutal, but it's um, one one negative aspect of it is you have to bill hours. Every tenth of an hour, you have to account for. Every six minutes, you have to account for and bill to a client. And keeping track of those timesheets can be a nightmare, uh, which is one reason I went in-house to get to get out of that. So I, I still have these nightmares that um, three months have gone by, and I haven't wrote down my hours yet, and I have to get up and do that. and I have to reconstruct the last three months of hours, and I'm just – or I, I forgot to – I didn't do work, and I'm, I have a deficit. So I still have that billable hour uh, uh, phobia thing um, that almost, I guess, traumatized me actually from being a lawyer, from being a big firm lawyer for 10 years. Uh, so I still have nightmares about that. Awesome. Awesome. Um, all right. We are at exactly two hours. Um, so maybe we do a follow up, um, you know, months or years later, because um, I have so many more questions to ask you. But uh, this has been an absolute delight. Yeah, maybe we could even break this one up into two parts. Or I might at my end, because uh, I noticed people don't like two hour podcasts, or maybe some people do. I don't know. Great. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll I'd, I'd be happy to do a, I'd be happy to do a follow up anytime. Fantastic. Um, I'll let you know when I've got my questions compiled and maybe we'll do another one and uh, we'll connect uh, after this uh, by email or something. Okay. Take okay. care, Jesse. Have, have a good Sunday. Have a good July 4th. You too. Bye-bye.